I reiterate my thank you to thank yous to everybody because it's just been a great experience for me and I've learnt so much every week so it's been wonderful to have you here um, week after week um, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I look forward to, to exploring the last session, which will cover um, Soviet Armenia, um, the construction of the capital of Yerevan by Alexander Tamanian, the Soviet Armenian architect. We'll look also at um, Armenian artists, in particular Mardaro Saryan, and the progression of his art. Um, through the Soviet years, to what extent did he change and evolve with the regime? Um, so we'll focus on art and architecture, but first of all, I'll give, as always, some historical context to some of the interpretive issues that historians have raised in relation to looking at Soviet Armenia. Um, and I'll also finish by looking briefly at the Thaw period, during which um, Armenian national identity began to be expressed in more open forms in culture. Um, and we'll hopefully get a bit of time to discuss contemporary Yerevan and dealing with the Soviet legacy today. Um, so the first part, we'll, we'll go into a sort of historical overview to give some context for viewing the art produced in this period. So um, the, the area of the scholarly literature on Soviet Armenia is, particularly in the English language, is very undeveloped. Um, so I'm afraid that I've largely relied on this book, uh, which is a sort of textbook by Ronald Grigor Suni. Um, it doesn't exclusively cover Soviet Armenia, but because Ronald Grigor Suni is an expert on the Soviet um, period, and he's Armenian, um, it goes into Soviet Armenia, um, into um, the Bolshevik period and then the Stalinist period, a focus on the Stalinist period and then the Thor period. So it, it gives a, a, a strong overview, whereas other works um, just focus on one period or another. And, and to be honest, that's more or less the only textbook that exists, as I said, in the English language so far on Soviet Armenia. So um, it's all we have to go on, really, those of us who aren't very fluent in Armenian and Eastern Armenian. So um, hopefully the field will develop further and um, there is actually a conference that's being organized for this summer, I think, um, on studies on Soviet Armenia that's taking place in Yerevan. So hopefully from this summer onwards, we'll have a lot more literature to work with, particularly in the English language. Um, and even, even the area actually of, of studies on Soviet nationalities policies and um, particularly the, the Caucasus um, republics within that area of study is relatively recent to develop and scholars like um, Ronald Suni are um, leaders in that area of starting to work on um, the role of national republics and to what extent national identity was allowed to be expressed or to what extent it was suppressed under Soviet rule. Um, so, Ronald Grigor Suni, in the book, looking towards Ararat that I just showed you, um, he puts forward this idea that um, there's the traditional opinion, the traditional historiography that um, Soviet rule suppressed national identity, that it was this um, prison house of nations. So there's this traditional idea that has dominated Soviet historiography for a long time and has viewed the Soviet rule um, over Armenia as a sort of dark period for national identity and suppression of national identity in various um, forms. But um, people like Ronald Suni have started to argue that Soviet policies towards nationalities actually um, changed over time, that they weren't just um, monolithic and, and weren't just suppressive of national identity, but that they allowed it to, to develop and even encouraged it to develop at certain periods in Soviet history. Um, so there were different moments when Armenians or other nationalities were freer under the Soviet um, rule. Um, and he says, he actually argues that it's, it's in reality the opposite to the prison house of nations and actually it's set in place uh, a lot of the features of modern Armenian identity, um, especially, especially in the later uh, Thor period. Um, so even um, people like Lenin and Stalin um, 
started to express the idea um, that Soviet rule was good for Armenia at the time, of course, um, because they would um, need to encourage Armenians to be um, thankful for Soviet rule um, and to develop an idea of Soviet rule as um, beneficial and beneficent to Armenians. So um, shortly after Armenia was Sovietized, was um, invaded, occupied, however you want to describe it, by um, the Bolshevik armies, um, in Pravda, which was the official publication of um, the Soviet Union, um, on the 4th of December 1920, Stalin himself, who was not in power at that point, um, but he was a significant um, character within the Bolshevik leadership, nevertheless. Um, he stated, in quotes, only the idea of Soviet rule brought to Armenia peace and the possibility of national rebirth. Long live Soviet Armenia. Um, <clears throat> and as you can see from these examples of, of visual culture, um, in particular the, the rug with the Soviet Armenian coat of arms, which is celebrating um, 10 years of uh, Soviet Armenia, 1925 to 35, with the, the Soviet coat of arms, which we'll come back to discussing later with the hammer and sickle, Mount Ararat, and these uh, grapes, um, this sort of vineyard uh, at the bottom. Um, so they, they show how Soviet uh, identity or Soviet imperatives, Soviet messages emerged with Armenian symbols. Um, during some periods of Soviet rule. So there, there goes on to be this sort of fusion in which um, some aspects of Armenian national identity are fostered. Um, also giving a positive account of the impact of Soviet rule on Armenian identity is this interview with the first secretary of Soviet Armenia, Karen Demirchian. Um, and the interview was carried out by historian Razmik Panosian and published in his book, The Armenians. Um, so Karen Demirchian, um, who I think was the last first secretary uh, before independence, perhaps, um, but he was tragically assassinated, as far as I know, or murdered. Um, and um, he said, in quotes, the communists first saved Armenia from guaranteed destruction in 1920. They took it out of the mouth of the lion or the crocodile and saved it. Thereafter, they began to build it up. By the 1930s, the communi communist leadership of Armenia had already developed a sense of national identity and the drive for national development. Subsequent first secretaries and other leaders continued this and strengthened it. We prepared the country for independence to be a strong republic. Hence, we did two things. A, kept national identity unique and developed it further, and B, built a strong economic base. We developed the country. This was very obvious by the 1960s. We had an army of 700,000 laborers with very high standards. The population increased from 700,000 in 1920 to 3.5 million. This was unprecedented. I'm very proud that as first secretary, 20% of the history of Soviet Armenia belongs to me. Um, so, obviously, as a leading um, Soviet Armenian statesman, he would give a positive perspective. But nevertheless, we do know that Soviet Armenia did see certain aspects of development. It saw um, urbanization, the population of Yerevan um, boomed um, in an unprecedented manner, um, levels of education increased, levels of literacy increased, um, things like that. So, there was development as Demir Chian describes. Um, and also we'll see in this lecture how uh, various aspects of Armenian national identity were allowed to be expressed or even developed through Soviet culture. Um, I should also mention that the reason why, well, an obvious reason why historians have been very reticent to um, portray Soviet rule in a positive way is because of um, the huge numbers of, of deaths, um, obviously the famines, the, the purges, um, executions, um, all of these, these terrible things that happened, particularly under Stalin, uh, but also under other uh, leaderships. Um, so it's, it's become a sort of um, a controversy to, to communicate anything positive about Soviet rule, given this, this very dark um, legacy of um, the Soviet years. Um, but nevertheless, as I said, some scholars like Ronald Sunni um, have started to... Um, advocate for the fact that there were some small ways in which um, some benefit was seen 
in Armenia, particularly with regard to national identity. So, um, in terms of general developments of Soviet rule, there were three periods of Soviet rule that I'm sure you all learned about in school. Um, so I won't go into these in detail and the, the, the changes in central Soviet policy. Um, so there were three periods, as I mentioned. The first period um, was that uh, which began um, with, obviously, the civil war between the Red and the White armies, um, and then uh, the policy of war communism, which was a very harsh policy, which was then turned around um, in 1921 to the new economic policy um, in which Lenin decided to allow more capitalistic um, activities to return. Um, so there was a very harsh period during the Civil War where um, many people uh, went through famine and um, reacted strongly against um, Bolshevik rule because of this war communism policy and seizure of um, farm land and, and things like that. Um, and so there was a turnaround in the 20s, 1921 to 28, which saw more tolerance in terms of the policy that was um, put forward by Lenin. Um, then with Stalin uh, coming into power um, and his sort of building of his dictatorship from 1928 um, and the peak of his power to his death in 1953, uh, we see a sequence of five-year plans, um, and these five-year plans pushed forward um, very difficult to achieve industrial and agricultural targets um, so that populations were squeezed um, to work as hard as they possibly could do, um, and areas of production were centralised and, and controlled by the state again, and farming was collectivised, so farming lands were um, owned by the state and held as collective farms or coal causes. Um, excuse my pronunciation as always. Um, so this was also a very um, dark period as I briefly mentioned um, because of um, terror. Stalin purged all of his perceived um, opponents um, and anybody who um, raised any kind of um, differing opinion um, to himself. Um, including examples like uh, the Armenian poet Yekice Charit, um, who died um, perhaps as a result of publishing a poem that Stalin um, may not have liked. Um, then after the death of Stalin in 1953, we see a relaxation of state control, the thaw period um, during which um, there were greater freedoms in terms of um, expression of national identity. Um, so, uh, let's see if we can get this back working, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, the, the next slide just sort of summarises some of those developments in terms of how they applied to Armenia. So, uh, things like what I already mentioned, urbanisation, the growth of the city of Yerevan, um, industrialisation, um, construction of huge um, mining um, plants um, in the areas outside of Yerevan, and such as at Alaverdi, where they built not only the, the mines, but also a new town was constructed there so that the workers could have somewhere to live um, close to the mine. Um, development of education and literacy, as I mentioned before, uh, promotion of things like Yerevan State University um, come from this period. Changing roles of women, uh, which was sort of applied um, to many of the, the nations in the Caucasus and Central Asia that that Soviet rule was viewed to be a move away from um, the sort of traditional um, uh, roles of women that were tied to um, religious um, beliefs and so um, the secularism of, of Soviet rule um, would allow women to have a, a greater part in society. Yeah, so um, I put this picture here because... Um, when I was first getting to know Armenia, I was um, living in Turkey at the time and I was travelling from Turkey to um, Yerevan and because of the closed border I had to travel from Mardin up to um, Trabzon um, and then across to the border uh, with Georgia to Tbilisi and then get the minibus down to Yerevan from there. So it was a bit of a long-winded journey um, and it involved driving past in the minibus this huge... Um, 
industrial area in Ala Verde. Um, and that really just, every time we went past it, it really captured my imagination because it, it looks absolutely derelict now. It's like a huge ghost town now. Um, I'm sure it is inhabited. I'm sure, you know, there are still things going on there, but nevertheless, um, nowhere near the, the, the scale of what it was in the Stalinist period. So it was just uh, remarkable that this huge um, industrial area was just carved out of the mountains, these snowy mountains halfway between um, Tbilisi and Yerevan, almost in the middle of nowhere, uh, and this absolutely vast um, industrial works, mining area, um, and also the town for the workers, as I said, was all con constructed there as well. So you see absolutely tons of housing blocks right next to the industrial area so that people could live there. Um, so, um, yeah, it's fascinating. I wish there would be more studies on things like this and trying to reconstruct, you know, what it was like to, to work there uh, when this was up and running. Um, so, yeah, many of these things still, you still see them as you go around Armenia today. Um, so there's still a legacy of, of this industrial development. Even in the center of Yerevan, there are still many factory areas that are now, in many cases, derelict. Um, so whether this can be called modernization, I'm not sure, because it's not still going, but there are other legacies, um, like that you might argue that um, the education um, and the scientific leadership that the Soviets imported into Armenia have translated into things like um, the position of Yerevan now in the tech industry that you know my husband works in. So um, it's because of his very strong scientist, scientific education that I think um, American companies um, and inter other international companies are employing people in Yerevan to work for them today. Um, in a sort of parallel, actually, with India, too. So, um, so um, I thought I would briefly go into the, the, how historians have interpreted the policy um, of the Soviets towards um, the Soviet republics, the national republics, during this period. And they've given the label of nativization um, policies. Um, so there's the implication that um, through nativization policies, both under Lenin and under Stalin, um, aspects of national identity were allowed to be expressed and were allowed to develop in certain ways, although there were some differences between 1920s when Lenin was in control and 1930s onwards when Stalin was in control. Um, so um, as I mentioned before, the period 1917 to 21 was a civil war, which was characterized by you know, violence, famine, um, and hardships. Um, but then later on in the 20s, Lenin decided to pursue this nativization um, approach. Um, and he argued that places like the Caucasus were different from Russia, um, more backwards in quotations, and thus needed different treatment. Um, and he argued that um, for small nations, um, they should actually be allowed to develop their own national identities rather than be um, assimilated into a sort of Russian Soviet identity. Um, and he believed that they should be given relative freedom to develop their national identity so that then, um, ironically, the proletariat would, would develop as well and they would discover on their own, um, you know, the true way of... Um, the Soviet Revolution. So he didn't want to apply pressure and to sort of convert these nations by force, um, but he argued that they should be given relative freedoms so that they could then develop on their own and then find communism um, at a later date through a sort of intellectual process of, of discovery. Um, and he also argued that because of the uh, the past um, and the imperial oppression that they'd already suffered under the Russian Empire, um, he argued that um, these small, smaller nations in the Caucasus and Central Asia um, shouldn't be oppressed under Soviet rule because they would just um, obviously rebel against it because of this history of oppression. And he didn't want Soviet rule to be, rule, to be viewed as a continuation of imperial oppression. Um, that was following the Russian imperial rule that they'd already experienced. So um, whether or not this translated into 
you know, the, the actual policy. This was mainly just discourse, I think, that was emanating from Lenin and, and idealistic discourse rather than actually what happened. But um, nevertheless, it did mean that there was some effort to tread carefully in the Caucasus and Central Asia in the 1920s. Um, and that, for instance, the conquest um, of Georgia, um, Lenin complained that some of his generals had been far too violent in Georgia and, and he actually wanted um, Georgia to be allowed, um, as I said before, to sort of find its own way into the Soviet Union rather than to be forced um, through military action. So anyway, um, this translated, as I said before, to this policy of nativization, uh, which meant that there was some local involvement in um, running of each respective area. Um, so they could develop their own administration, their own economic organs, um, and some areas of culture were allowed to be uh, redeveloped to express some aspects of national identity. Um, and as it says here, um, it was viewed that development of national culture would actually go hand in hand with state-directed industrialization. So they would actually you know, feed into and, and help one another. Um, and so a number of, of new institutions were developed um, that expressed national productions in some form or national culture, like theatres, opera houses, Newspapers in local languages, museums were established, a national radio and the Academy of Sciences. Um, and language of instruction was Armenian um, and very important institutions that remain today, like Yerevan State University, were established. Um, but it was important that this expression of national culture through language um, and other aspects like theatres, opera and so on, um, remained on message in terms of what they expressed. So they weren't totally free to express what they wanted to express. They had to express Soviet values. Um, so although some of the, the, the manner in which they were expressed um, were sort of national ways of expression or national sort of symbols and things like that, um, they had to express Soviet values such as collective spirit rejecting egotism, celebration of the October Revolution, hatred for Tashnaks, who had previously controlled um, the Republic, and suspicion of the West. So, um, so you see this sort of um, merging of these two imperatives, Soviet values and national forms in this period. Um, so I'll, I'll go over this very quickly. It's just showing ways in which this new economic policy of the 1920s, the more liberal policy after the Civil War, um, led to some aspects of modernization in, in Armenia, such as building canals, irrigation of desert areas, electrification, um, and, um, and also the boom of, of Yerevan's population. So since... Um, 1897 to 1926, the number of town and city dwellers almost doubled. Um, so this has really become uh, a population that was majority city dwellers um, under Soviet rule. In, under Stalinism from 1928 to 53, as I mentioned before, you had a radical change in policies, collectivization, so collecting up all of the separate um, individually owned farms um, and translating them into state-run um, collective farms um, and also state-run industry, um, which was known as the five-year plan, um, which, as I said, also put forward impossible targets for workers to try to achieve and then celebrated these workers if they actually managed to achieve them. Um, so the result in, in Armenia was that... Um, this sort of disrupted the social dynamic to some extent. Some families who had controlled agriculture in the past were removed in favor of loyal officials. Um, and there was an attack on bourgeoisie in the city. Um, and um, there was a new industrial working class, um, that some of whom rose to important positions in officialdom. So generally under Stalin, you see more of a shake-up in terms of who was involved and more of a focus on proletariat um, performing um, important tasks, whereas in the 1920s you still had some 
continuity in terms of um, the bourgeoisie were allowed to remain um, in positions of power. Um, I should also mention the church, uh, because that's particularly important for pre-Soviet Armenian identity. Um, so in 1923, um, the church was accused of collaboration with the Tashnaks and the diaspora. Um, as a result of this, nearly all the churches closed, priests were attacked by the secret police and communist youth associations, um, and the Catholicos refused to recognize the Soviet regime until 1927. Um, then you see even further restrictions in 1929, uh, religious freedoms were suspended and churches heavily taxed. Um, but um, you also see a turnaround in 1932 with a pro-Moscow Catholicos appointed, so mo they start to work more closely with the, the Soviet regime in the 30s. Um, and then in the 30s, as with all other areas of, of Stalinist life, um, the church was affected by purges, and so bishops were accused of possessing nationalist books and executed. Um, one example that's relevant for the city of Yerevan itself is the uh, demolition of demolition of churches, um, and this huge church of St. Peter's and Paul um, by the architects Tiran Turkanian and Gevork Kocha. Uh, oh no, that was, sorry, that was the architect of the cinema. I don't know who the architects of the church were. Um, but as you can see, it was a huge church, um, sort of basilica style, though. It's interesting how it doesn't take the centrally planned style um, of the um, sort of the, the churches that we've looked at earlier in, in this course, um, the typical national Armenian churches, um, although it does have this bell tower that has a conical dome um, in front of it. Um, so that was demolished and replaced with this, which is now there today, which is the Moscow Cinema, which was built in 1936. Um, Again, it would be interesting. I don't know when exactly the church was demolished. Maybe other people do in this room. Um, whether that was something that was done in, 30, in the 30s under Stalin or before that date, um, at what time um, Yerevan was sort of purged of its churches, I'm not sure. So that would be something interesting to look into in the future. So now we'll look at the cultural examples. Um, how did Stalinism impact on... Um, official culture. So in the 1920s under Lenin, um, there was more freedom for intellectuals and for cultural producers. Um, but this changed in the 1930s when Stalin um, created his dictatorship and he, um, he took on a much stronger role, a sort of um, controlling role in relation to artistic production um, as the chief censor of all artistic production. So he took a personal role overseeing artistic production within um, the Soviet sphere. Um, so um, culture was increasingly used for political purposes. So in the earlier 1920s, it was used to encourage Bolshevik policies like reading and um, emancipation of women and things like that, but in the, in the Stalinist period, you see um, culture was used explicitly to communicate um, the goals of the five-year plan, so it was encouraged to support collectivization, industrialization, and the targets of these five-year plans, so it was a much more specific political use of art in, these period, in this period. Um, and as a result, um, there was much more tighter control over artists and, and cultural producers under Stalin and who was on message and um, eradication of those who... Uh, so um, this involved in 1932 the creation of unions. Um, so you had the, the independent literary groups in um, the various republics abolished and the creation of the Union of Soviet Writers established in 1932. Um, and this also corresponded to other unions in cultural spheres like the artists union um, too so it was not just writers but also other areas of culture that had unions established so um, this establishment of unions already created a system of sort of um, supervision of what was being created um, in that artists would um, would watch what other artists were doing would would inform if they weren't 
producing according to directives, and, and they would also agree on um, messages or imagery that was going to be um, prioritised in, in any particular period. Um, so in 1934, that after discussions by the unions, um, the style of socialist realism was established as the official style of Soviet um, republics. Um, socialist realism was... Um, in a way, a move back to realism, because um, in the 1920s under the Bolsheviks, artists had moved much further into abstraction. So there was a move away from um, art as representation of the world in the earlier 1920s under the Bolsheviks. So um, what we mean by socialist realism is a return to some kind of realistic methods of representation of people and you know scenes that are recognisable that are not abstract. Um, so... Um, that's how it, it corresponds to realism, and it was also believed at the time to correspond to the real life that surrounded people in Stalinist Russia, but although now we view it as hugely exaggerated and preposterous. Uh, so the, the term socialist realism to us in our minds now seems like a bit of a sort of... Um, almost a, a comedy label, because we think, how can this <laughs> be believed to reflect realism um, within our own um, sort of current perspectives? Um, so, but at the time it was a huge shift from the nine, early, earlier 1920s and the abstraction of those years. So it was a return to portraying real people um, and doing real things like um, this reaper who was um, working in the fields uh, har harvesting the crops. Um, so as this example shows, it was a return to depicting above all proletarian scenes, um, workers in collective farms or in factories um, and in this way it supported the five-year plan uh, because it glorified these workers so they were um, they were often um, depicted as it says here in epic or dramatic form so they were building things that were um, you know magnificent feats of engineering um, or during the war, they could be about um, the victories of the war um, and making parallels with great um, war uh, generals or, or um, historical figures um, of the past. Um, and what is important is that um, the realist element meant that the proletariat, the ordinary people, could understand these paintings and they could recognise what they were seeing um, And because the people had been... Um, to some extent um, not able to follow the abstraction of the, the 1920s and the Bolsheviks. So that it was about trying to capture the public um, again and, and harness them through propaganda. Um, so again, scholars have been uh, reticent to say um, that um, this was a period that was good for the arts because it was obviously a period that was... Um, characterised by um, political pressure and, and purges and so on. But some people have spoken out, like Dick Ran Kumjian in, in his article on the status of the artists and intellectuals in Soviet Armenia. And in this article he said that actually if the cultural elite worked within the system, uh, that is they communicated the messages that were required by Stalinism, um, and if they were party and union members, then they had a relatively good lifestyle, uh, which I suppose is not surprising, but at the same time it's been controversial to even say that in the past because of all the, um, the sort of, um, as I said, the, the, the darkness that has characterised this um, period in the past in, in historiography. Um, and Dick Ran Kumjian also said that um, Within this system, they were also able to express a few national themes like love of language, pride in Armenian history and culture. Um, they were able to talk about lost lands in Turkey and especially depict Mount Ararat. Um, they express a need for unity, the beauty of Armenia and praise of Soviet Armenia as the national center of all Armenians. So, um, so through promoting um, symbols of Armenian culture like Mount Ararat, they were promoting Soviet Armenia as um, you know, the new protector of, of Armenians and, and trying to um, attract further Armenians from the diaspora to repatriate to um, Soviet Armenia. 
Um, and as Kum Jian states in his article, uh, they had these wonderful facilities. I stayed here in my first visit um, to Armenia, which is um, a wonderful resort in Zakatzo by Lake Sevan, uh, which is the writer's house resort, uh, which I, I encourage you to go there if you haven't already, um, because it's a real, um, <coughs> a real sort of um, <coughs> historical artifact, because um, all of the ballrooms, the, the bedrooms, uh, the dining rooms, everything is decorated exactly how it, it used to be in the Soviet period. So it's absolutely fascinating to go and see all these Soviet era um, rooms absolutely untouched since um, 1970s or so when, when they were reconstructed. And, and I think they were reconstructed faithfully to how they were in the 1930s because many of the decorations look quite Stalinist. Uh, on the inside with like mosaics and things like that showing um, industrial and um, farming scenes. So they had these facilities, so they had these perks even though it was obviously a very difficult period. So now I thought we'd look at two examples to discuss this idea of national informed Soviet content. So how were artists or architects able to express their Armenian um, national form, but how did they play this sort of tightrope to remain Soviets in the message that they were communicating so that they didn't get in trouble with the authorities or the unions. Um, so we'll begin with Mardiros Sarian, um, because it, again I think it's, it's remarkable that there really hasn't been that much written about Mardiros Sarian. Um, Obviously, he's a very well-known figure within Armenia today, and, and he's a, his house museum is a, a fixture on the tourist itinerary, so everybody knows about him, but there really haven't been very many academic works, particularly in the English language, that have explored his career. Um, so what I really enjoy doing with my students is um, exploring the database of the National Gallery of Armenia, which you can go away and explore as well. Um, I've included a link here to the database. Um, it's freely available. I don't know if this will work. I'll try clicking on it and see if it does open, but if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. No? Okay. No. Well, um, I'll just, I won't explore it here, but um, anyway, it's, it's just a lot of fun in terms of seeing the progression of artists' careers um, through scrolling down um, the database collection. So the, the National Gallery of Armenia um, has obviously the world's greatest collection of many Armenian artists, including Madara Sarian and other people like Panos Terlemezian um, or Vatka Serenian. Many of these artists, um, their art, art works are very well represented um, through the, the collections here. So if you look up their names on the database and just click here and say find, um, then it displays um, all of their artworks um, down below in a chronological fashion. Um, so you get a really interesting insight into the progression of their work over time. So you can see their earlier work. This is Sarian's works in the collection. So first of all, you can see there are absolutely tons of them. Um, and um, yeah, second of all, they're organized chronologically according to the collection. So. You can see the earlier works where Sarian, um, who was trained within the Russian imperial system and then he moved to Soviets, um, I think he moved under the First Republic and he also had a sort of close relationship with the Tashnaks for a while and then he um, got closer to um, the Soviet um, authorities later. Um, so in his earlier works he shows this sort of Russian imperial context of his education and then as time goes on he starts to paint some more colourful Orientalist works, 1911, 1912. Um, and then when Soviet rule comes, and then you see sort of paintings of Armenian uh, illuminated manuscripts in 1915 and um, some other uh, political figures and so on. Uh, but I think what's really interesting is when um, Soviet power has sort of um, concretized or sort of... Um, become uh, better established in Armenia, you start to see Sarian 
um, making more explicitly um, Soviet Armenian works. I don't know if these were ever published, so that would be something interesting worth looking into. Oop. Lewis will go back. Ah, there we go. Yeah, so these are some examples from 1923 that I've picked out. Um, so you can see already how um, Maduro Sarian has developed a new Sovietized style through these works. Um, as I said, I don't know to what extent these were actually published or whether they were just with, remained within his private collection um, and were then inherited by the gallery. Um, but I find it interesting how he's already um, developing some of the, the sort of cliches of Soviet Armenian identity in these works, even by 1923, um, like um, the fruits. Um, Armenia was nearly always portrayed in Soviet propaganda as this sort of very um, verdant land with um, prosperous uh, vegetation and, and exotic fruit and vegetables that were growing. Um, so you can see these sort of pomegranates and grapes and uh, apricots and things like that all the time in these Soviet images. Um, and already Sarian's put that in the middle on his calendar from 1923. But then on the right as well, he's got the ha hammer and sickle. Um, but as you can see, he's still um, using the Armenian language as we discussed before. So he wasn't... Um, put under pressure to use Russian in his um, works at this point, or even later. Um, this is an example of a painting, um, which was obviously a public work, which was exhibited in 1923. Um, so here, I think he's successfully fused um, some Soviet messages, like sort of collective spirit. So you can see these dancers who are all in a circle holding hands. Um, so you could say that's just, you know, Armenian traditional dance, that's Armenian identity, but you could also say that's, you know, Soviet collective identity too, collective spirit. Um, he's depicted the mountains, um, although Ararat isn't 100% the focus, although it, the mountains are there. Um, and he's also actually managed to retain a monastery on a hill, um, so religion hasn't become um, completely thrown out of the equation at this point. Um, but nevertheless, I think that the collective spirit of this, of Armenians, is the strongest message, and the Armenian mountains are highlands there. Um, so there he's managed to fuse, I think, these national and, and Soviet messages quite successfully. Um, here... You see him change in the 1930s to correspond to Stalinist um, five-year plan messages. So um, he depicts a painting of the Alaverdi um, industrial works that I showed the photograph of. Um, but then he, he sort of makes it his own through his use of his um, colour palette. He's always using these bright colours and, and strokes um, to make it distinctively Mada Rosarian. Um, in the middle... I find that painting of the construction of a bridge over a river at Guitar particularly fascinating because um, it looks like one of these um, sort of impossibly challenging works um, that were mandated by the five-year plan, this huge bridge that's being constructed over the river Guitar um, that's sort of bombastic in the scale of it. Um, and you can see how it's being constructed using these little... Um, wooden um, scaffolds, um, how it's kind of fusing these modern with these traditional methods of building as well. Um, and um, as a comment of the, the sort of clash, I suppose, between uh, these modernization um, works and this huge bridge that's being constructed and then the old ways of life is this caravan that's um, still using the old route uh, that's passing parallel with the river and, and um, is passing under um, the last piece of the bridge that, that has uh, remained open. So I think um, Sarian, although he's praising the construction works of Stalinist Russia, not Russia, the Stalinist Soviet Union, um, and Armenia uh, within that, he's sort of critiquing it as well, I think, through showing this old-fashioned uh, traditional Armenian caravan um, and, and sort of complaining about the loss of those traditional ways of life too, maybe. Um, but nevertheless, you can see all the workers who are toiling away, uh, both 
on the side of the painting and on the bridge, they're all over. Um, so this is definitely communicating about the productivity of the five-year plans and, and how much they've uh, modernised Armenia. And then on the right, you can see collective spirit of the um, meeting of workers and farmers, uh, workers and farmers in the collective farm. Um, but then you've still got the Armenian landscape and the colours of Armenia. Um, so it's fusing again these Stalinist um, policy imperatives, the collective farm, collective spirit, um, and at the same time the Armenian landscape and Armenian um, colour translating to sort of prosperity, abundance and, and things like that, healthiness. So it gets also quite interesting when you get to the war. Um, Sarian paints this very... Um, poignant picture, um, which is called Flowers to the Armenian Fighters of the Great Patriotic War. And um, it's almost as if he's, um, he's not really sure what to paint. He, he wants to paint something that, that he views as being fitting to the memory of all the fallen, because obviously Armenia lost a tremendous amount of um, fighters during the Great Patriotic War. Um, and so he's trying to... Um, paint something very heartfelt to remember them, but at the same time, you feel like he, he does feel the restrictions of, of the Stalinist system at this moment, that he's not quite sure what he can paint so that it's not uh, something that would be um, controversial. Um, because if you remember um, Stalinist um, cultic imagery, the cult of Stalin himself um, comes out of the Second World, the Great Patriotic War, and so um, the, the focus in the visual arts is increasingly on painting portraits of Stalin, um, and Stalin is isolated in these portraits and portrayed as the great general and the sort of saviour of the world. So um, there would have been, I suppose, more tension for um, other artists painting other subjects in terms of what they could portray about the war um, within this context of, of Stalin being um, the focus of attention and, and getting all of the, the praise from the war. So how can you commemorate um, the loss of all these um, lives? Um, and that's a conflict that you also see in, in um, Victory Park in Yerevan, where you know, you've got the park that's renamed Victory Park um, after the Great Patriotic War, but um, in the middle of it, you've got this huge colossal statue of Stalin. So you think, you know, how can you remember those lost, uh, lost lives of the war um, and have that fused with the presence of Stalin and the, the victory of Stalin and, and this sort of um, iconic godlike figure of Stalin looming over that memory? Um, so it becomes a bit of a, a difficult time, I think, for artistic producers in terms of how they communicate loss. Um, so, and there are just some more examples that show, as I said before, this development of the image of Armenia as this um, land of plenty um, and associated with all these wonderful uh, apricots, peaches and, and other um, fruits being gathered by Armenian women um, in the fields. And this image that you can see in this, in this painting, Harvest, by Madara Sarian, actually gets... Um, translated into a, a poster, as you can see um, here. Um, it's quite a similar image. It's almost sort of turned the other way around because you've got, again, the grapes and the apricots and the Armenian woman, um, although this is actually from an earlier period um, than from the painting. So after the death of Stalin, or around the death of Stalin, you start to see more freedom in painting, um, and you start to see uh, Madara Sarian focusing on images that show Ararat almost exclusively. So um, you do get the picture that um, he's now started to move away from um, the pressure to communicate the glory of the five-year plans or these other Soviet messages, and he's got greater freedom to focus more on Armenian symbols exclusively. So here, um, I had a wonderful essay by a student the last term when I taught this, um, who was describing this painting, Ararat from Dvin, which was painted in 1952, so just before the death of Stalin. And um, she was saying how um, the archaeological site of Dvin 
um, is depicted in the sort of foothills of um, the mountain of Ararat. And it's interesting how he aligns this sort of historic um, Armenian capital with uh, the mountain of Ararat in this painting. Um, and he's quite cleverly sort of making a, a statement about the past of Armenian identity and its symbolic um, continuity. Um, and then in the image from 1961, he's showing a church. And um, from the 60s, obviously, you were increasingly free to communicate national messages, as we'll see through looking at the Thor. Um, <clears throat> Posters are quite interesting within the Soviet sphere in terms of um, when they're produced locally, um, they do tend to show more local messages and they use the local language, obviously. Um, and um, these examples from 1938 and 1950 show, as I mentioned already, this sort of repetitive association of Armenia with Armenian um, sort of women, female, um, iconic figures, um, and agricultural productivity. So all these wonderful um, fruits and um, verdant pastures. So now we'll look briefly at architecture. Um, so we often forget that um, Yerevan had a sort of Persianate um, urban layout um, before the Russian imperial um, takeover. So um, obviously after the Treaty of Gulistan in the early 19th century and the Russian occupation of Yerevan, um, Yerevan was under the Persians. So um, you had a big Persian citadel. Within the Persian citadel you had I think three mosques, something like that. So it was quite, and palaces. It was quite a large complex. You also had um, the mosque that's still there um, in the center of Yerevan, and you had um, <clears throat> uh, Islamic style or Persian style market um, areas. So you had this typical um, Islamic city separation of the citadel area where the, um, the palace would be and the imperial mosque and the market area where you'd have an additional mosque and all of the, the markets, the shops. Um, so this urban layout was changed quite dramatically with, with the Russian occupation and a move away from the Persian citadel and the separation between the market area and the citadel. Um, and um, again, with my students, um, I like to explore this online database, which again, I encourage you to explore um, in your own time, um, because this, I don't know actually who it's made by, but knows. Um, it's called Hin Yerevan, Old Yerevan, and um, it's a database of um, thousands of photographs of historic um, Yerevan. Um, and it's a map so that you, you hover over different areas of the city um, and you change the timeline um, so that you can go back to you know, 1838 or you can go up to um, the early 2000s. Um, and then it will display photographs that correspond to those periods in that place on the map. So it's an absolutely wonderful database. Um, it's really useful for exploring with students how the city changed. Um, and, um, and it's really interesting in terms of unpicking the historiography as well, because, as I said, not that many people have actually worked on this area of um, the history of art and architecture. So um, a lot of the Soviet cliches um, about Yerevan are that it was this sort of completely undeveloped farming village before the Soviets came along, and then the Soviets completely built it from scratch. And um, the Soviet accounts describe, like, there were no works of architecture, there were just mud huts, and then the Soviets came along and built it. <laughs> so, um, so if you explore the 19th century photographs on this database, then it gives you a clearer picture of what actually was there and the ways in which the Soviets redeveloped um, and worked with some aspects that were already established. Um, so this is quite interesting that it's showing the citadel with the mosques. I think um, one of my colleagues um, who works at the University of Vienna, he wrote an article about the mosques and the citadel and what buildings were there. And I think he said that there were two Persian mosques and one Ottoman period mosque. Um, but I, I think they're largely um, 
not there now, but perhaps archaeological excavations could, could rediscover them. But they were destroyed. I think most of them were destroyed under the Russians, so um, it wasn't a sort of Soviet or a post-Soviet um, thing, but actually a Russian imperial thing. Um, so with the Russian occupation of the um, early 19th century, you have the construction of the Russian imperial quarter, um, which is now Abovian Street, which still remains in Yerevan. So that's why on Abovian Street, you tend to see buildings that have the older uh, Russian imperial design of the early 19th century, um, or to, to mid 19th century. So they tend to still have this sort of neoclassical um, and relatively low-lying single story or double story um, design. Um, but as you can see from the image from 1920, before the rebuilding under Tamanyan, you can see the churches that are um, dispersed around, so they were still there at that point in 1920. Um, but many of the buildings before Tamanyan's redevelopment were admittedly relatively low, um, low level in ter terms of um, Tamanyan c comes along and constructs um, two or three story uh, apartment blocks, which uh, mean that the level of the city is on a much more monumental level after he uh, redesigns it. So although it's not sort of mud huts, um, <laughs> there were quite a few um, <clears throat> different zones of the city that already existed, including the Russian Imperial, city, Imperial Quarter. Um, the idea that the Soviets built everything from, from scratch is um, obviously incorrect. Um, this is the first Republic government house, so this may have been constructed by Tamanian. I'm not 100% sure, because um, in one of the most detailed books on Tamanian's construction of Soviet Yerevan, it talks about him working um, for the first Republic government and constructing a number of works in the city plan at that moment. Um, so he may have been active in, in building this uh, first government house, we're not sure. Um, as far as I know, nothing's been um, written about it. Um, but I thought I'd just draw your attention to it. It's generally this typical Russian neoclassical style, but it does have these quite prominent grapevine motifs, which Tamanian brings even more to the fore in his later designs. Um, these are just some more examples from before Tamanian's buildings. Um, some more eclectic examples. Um, I also wanted to show these... Persian buildings, because you had obviously a much bigger Persian population and Muslim population um, before um, Yerevan was more sort of homogenized um, later on. So on the Hin Yerevan database, you can also find quite a few sort of Muslim Persian residences, uh, which are quite interesting in terms of their architecture and how different they are to the Russian neoclassical works. So now that, let's look at Tamanian himself. Um, and he's tended to be portrayed differently in different contexts. So for Soviet art historians um, and also for historians who work primarily on Soviet architecture in the present day, he's viewed as um, this sort of very progressive architect who implemented um, a new kind of um, city plan, the garden city plan, into Yerevan, and, and he was quite um, a sort of... Um, Pathbreaker in, in that sense, because not many other Soviet republics had um, a brand new city from scratch, um, as Tamanyan um, put forward for Yerevan. Um, many of the other cities had um, grand plans in the 1920s and 1930s that were um, drawn up, but they weren't implemented. Um, so Yerevan's quite unusual in that the plan was actually implemented. Um, and you had one architect who planned all of it and implemented it all. Um, but on the contrary, as with all Armenian um, sort of cultural producers within this context, um, from the Armenian perspective, he's valued much more because of his um, sort of cultural specificity and the way that he used the opportunity of rebuilding Yerevan to incorporate historic Armenian architecture into Soviet architecture. So... Um, <clears throat> these two different strands of the historiography um, have emerged through writings about Tamanian. Um, so this is the plan of, of Yerevan. So he's known for a new type of city plan because it was based on these um, sort of um, <clears throat> radial, um, radial ring roads that um, go
go around the different um, zones of the city and allow um, inhabitants of the city to move around more easily um, rather than to um, sort of get stuck in, in jams, in traffic jams or, or so on. So remember that um, this period sees the development of new types of transport and, and also it's very important in terms of developing green spaces too. Um, and the Soviets in this period redeveloped lots of cities to try and incorporate more green spaces. So you can see lots of parks uh, that are interspersed around the city plan. Um, so as I mentioned before, this was an example of the garden city movement. So um, it's a new approach to planning that actually came from Britain. Um, but you saw the most examples in America um, in the 1900s. And um, as I said, you had these different zones uh, within the city. You had a central area, but then you had the city um, organized into se separate zones that included different areas for residential um, spaces, different areas for industry and agriculture, but then easy transportation um, through linking them uh, through concentric circles and radiating streets. So you have this circular layout, but then you have these um, radial streets. So you also see, to some extent, in Tamanian's plan. Um, and this is a comparison between Tamanian's 1924 plan and the Russian plan. So this was um, what Yerevan looked like um, under the Russians. So um, as I mentioned before, it wasn't as if the Russians didn't develop it at all, but nevertheless, they, they tended to stick with a fairly traditional grid um, layout that you can just about see on this very old map. Um, and a central um, feature of it was actually the English garden, which is here, um, which still exists today in, in Yerevan as part of Tamanian's plan. So he incorporated the Russian plan, the imperial plan, within his um, new plan, which is also interesting in terms of, you know, this argument between um, newness and tradition and, and how he... Um, <clears throat> represented both of those. So this was a main feature of his new city, um, these big new ceremonial open spaces um, where um, Soviet parades could take place. Um, so this was Lenin Square, which is now Republic Square, which is in the centre of the city. Um, so it was surrounded by the new government buildings of the Republic. Um, you had um, the museum, uh, there in the middle, you had um, the government house to the right side and various ministries around the side. And you also had a Lenin statue um, that was put in the square so that the parades would um, move through past the Lenin statue as part of the parade. Um, this is what the square looked like um, before. Yerevan was rebuilt under Tamanian. So again, it's interesting in terms of, you know, how far reaching were these changes in reality. Um, and I found these quite surprising when I saw them in Yerevan City Museum, uh, because I had this impression again that Yerevan wasn't developed at all. There wasn't a major square on that same site before uh, Lenin Square or Republic Square. But actually these photographs imply that this was already quite an important um, center of the city. Another important building of Tamanian that I'm sure you all know is his opera house um, and the government house um, that is shown on the right side. So the opera house was a different location um, on the map. I'm interested primarily in, in the issue of Tamanian's use of Armenian ornaments and um, to what extent that was new, whether that was his directive or whether it was a craftsman who was working under him. Because as I said, um, in the historiography, he's primarily associated with this sort of revival of Armenian um, identity through architecture as part of the nativization policy. So um, <clears throat> these, these are interesting. These are in the Museum of Architects in Yerevan. And um, <clears throat> these are facade designs, which imply that Tamanian designed the buildings first, and then he added the ornament afterwards. So they're quite interesting in terms of um, you know, design process, how these buildings appear without the ornament, uh, because in our minds the, the Armenian ornament is so central to these buildings that it's, it's quite shocking actually to see and, and it really accentuates how neoclassical these structures are and their resemblance to other Stalinist architecture at the time. 
So um, this is a, a picture of the plan. So this is a, a detail of the ornament. Um, so you can see um, its characteristic features looking back to medieval Armenian architecture. <clears throat> so there are some indications that um, the carved stone was, was by a different craftsman called Stepanian, um, but I don't know to what extent he designed the stonework or if it was designed by Tamanian and then um, just simply um, carved by um, Stepanian. Uh, but these are some examples that are known to be crafted by Stepanian. Um, and this is from the government house. So you can see, again, these basket capitals that are typical of um, Zvartnots Cathedral. Um, the frieze that looks like um, Akhtamar Cathedral from Van, Lake Van in Turkey. Um, and um, these are just some examples to show the similarity of the frieze here on Akhtamar Cathedral with what we saw um, up here, and also uh, here, along there. Um, so there's a similar sort of vine scroll with animals that you see from Act Actimar Cathedral that he repeats on the government house and on uh, the opera house. And these are some examples from Svartnots Cathedral, the basket capital that you see, and the vine scroll. Um, and the basket capital is here on that side which is a very typical medieval Armenian type of um, column capital. So, um, and here, uh, this niche, very characteristic niche of, of Annie, which you also see, obviously, on the um, government house here. So there's no doubt that he was looking to these medieval Armenian models, um, and it's interesting that he was looking to Akhtamara, because the... The historiography has tended to associate Tamanyan with Toros Toromanian, who was um, the archaeologist who was excavating Ani, um, so, and also Zvartnots to some extent. Um, but the fact that he was looking to models like Aksumar Cathedral suggests that he actually had a, a broader view of medieval Armenian architecture. So he wasn't just um, drawing on the recent excavations, but he, he also knew these works in, in Ottoman Turkey. Um, so, in other words, there are still some questions, I think, in terms of who was deciding about this Armenian ornament, where, what kind of ornament was going to be used, and whether it was Tamanian or it was discussions with Taurus Toromanian or even Stepanian, the, the um, stone carver. So, um, another point is everybody always ignores the extent to which um, Tamanian's works. Um, built on his imperial um, training. Um, so he was educated at the Imperial School of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg. Um, he made his name in Moscow and St. Petersburg building mansions for elites who were tied to imperial rule. Um, and this is a very famous example from the early 20th century, the Sherbatov mansion in Moscow. Um, and I think he was very much building on that experience, and you can see quite a similar palazzo tower and this neoclassical approach that, that sort of comes back later in things like the government house, uh, which people tend to uh, ignore. Um, and people like Tamanyan's career actually had a lot in common with other Russian um, or Soviet architects who came out of the Russian imperial tradition, like uh, Alexei Shushev, um, who um, built the Hotel Moscow, um, which again has some close relationships with um, Tamanian's designs, as we'll see in a minute. Um, and actually, Shushev and Tamanian worked together on a couple of projects too, so they, they knew each other and they, um, they came out of actually the same um, architectural movement in early 20th century St. Petersburg. Um, Something I, I often show my students is this rather provocative comparison, uh, which shows the Yerevan Opera House and the Palace of the Soviets um, design on the right side. Um, so the design, this is the design that was chosen. There was a huge competition and lots of different Soviet architects submitted plans for it. Um, and so the competition was going like from the 1920s to 1931. Finally, they chose this as the victorious composition. And um, it was by Boris 
Ayafan, but then later it, it was revised by Shuko, the guy I just mentioned, and, and Vladimir Gelfrig. And um, it was this huge um, institution that was planned to be in the center of Moscow um, and crowned by a monumental statue of Lenin. Uh, but it was built by, it was planned to be built by Stalin. Um, and it's sort of the culmination of Stalinist um, architectural um, development and how different it was from architecture under Lenin because he wanted to return to this neoclassical architecture and very monumental, bombastic architecture that Lenin's architects had tried to move away from with their more abstract architecture and more practical architecture. So um, I find it quite interesting how similar, if you look just to the bottom part of the Palace of the Soviets, which in itself reminds me of the Colosseum um, in its sort of um, rounded structure and its neoclassical um, sort of um, repetition of columns, um, how far that resembles in some ways the, uh, the Yerevan opera, if you take away all the Armenian ornament, then you're left with something that's actually quite similar to what other Soviet architects were doing during the Stalinist period. Um, and then if you look to more comparisons, you can see yet more similarities. Uh, this was the People's Commissariat of Heavy Industry, which was never constructed, but at the same time um, quite influential as a design um, by Ivan Fromin, who was a very... Um, successful Soviet architect under Stalin and um, yeah again you can see this um, sort of open colonnade and palazzo design that's quite similar to what Tamanian was doing um, and even more controversially um, but at the same time going back to my point about nationalities policies um, the government house in Baku is quite similar in terms of neoclassicism um, and fitting in with this general architectural development of Stalinism and how that architecture changed from the 1920s, um, but allowing to include some um, sort of traditional Azari motifs within that. So it's a similar fusion of neoclassical Stalinism with some local Azerbaijani um, architectural or Persianate architectural motifs. Um, so that suggests that, you know, perhaps Tamanian wasn't so, so unique. Perhaps there were parallels that we can find in, in different um, republics, and partic particularly in the Caucasus. Um, one thing we can discuss at the end is, is the statues. Um, maybe some people might have memories of some of the statues. I don't know if they were still around. Uh, this is the statue that used to be in Republic Square or Lenin Square, um, and the same sculptor, Sergei Mokurov, was responsible for the Lenin statue, which was in Republic Square, but also a statue of Stepan Shalmian, which is still there, as far as I know. Um, so it's interesting that that one's remaining, but the Lenin one's gone, the Stalin one's gone. But um, uh, Stepan Shalmian, I'm sure all of you know, was um, uh, a member of the, or was he the leader of the, yeah, he was the leader of the Baku Commune. So he was a very important early Armenian Bolshevik, uh, because the Baku Commune was like an early epicenter of, of um, the Bolshevik movement, so um, he was a leading figure there, and so this was this legacy was really celebrated um, under Soviet Armenia as, as a leading Armenian Bolshevik. So that's still there, um, and then of course Stalin in Victory Park. Um, who was replaced um, by Mother Armenia, as we'll see in a minute. So I was going to show you the um, Soviet anthem, but I think you can watch it yourself, <laughs> just to contrast with what we saw in the first um, class uh, and how the, the symbols of Armenianness were, were changed a bit. I'll just wrap up very briefly talking about the Thor, because I think probably you've heard enough of me uh, today, and just about how Armenianness is starting to be allowed to be communicated much more openly um, and through uh, more empowering um, methods, let's say, through more empowering images like this one. A poster from 1970, Armenia, the country of sunshine, it says. <laughs> um, so, again, the historiography is kind of dominated by this guy, um, Ronald Sunni, um, and he argues that... Um, 
in the thaw after the death of Stalin, there was a period of official nationalism. So this was um, a number of policies that allowed nationalism to be developed, but they would only allow certain figures to be promoted. So um, if anyone was too controversial, then they weren't allowed to make a statue to them. They were, they were just a collection of, of figures that were allowed to be um, uh, commemorated or revered. Um, and many of these figures were ones who showed continuity with um, Russian imperial rule, which was interesting. Um, so they constructed uh, some new um, statues um, to people like um, Nalbandian, um, Patkanyan, Rafi, and so on, and renamed streets in Yerevan after people who, again, were intellectual figures that were mainly coming from the Russian imperial background. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the Stalin statue was replaced with the Mother Armenia statue that you can see here in 1962. Um, so Ronald Sunni says that, that all of these um, policies and these relative freedoms um, were sort of relatively harnessed quite well by the Soviet state until 1965 and the genocide commemorations. And it was at that point that um, they had to change um, their tack um, and take on a, an even more um, <clears throat> sort of open or um, accommodating policy. So um, during this period of official nationalism, as it says here, you still had to appeal, appear loyal to communism. So um, the support of Russia and or the USSR was still viewed as very necessary for protection. Um, and so um, anger was directed primarily against the Turks or against other um, enemies rather than against Soviet rule. Um, and so the, the example of Parajanov shows, I think, how um, you were allowed greater freedoms to talk about, you know, the religious heritage or um, the importance of Armenians under imperial Russia. Um, the example of Hakob of Natanian, who was that painter who I mentioned in the session about imperial Russia, who was a very important painter. Um, in Tiflis. Um, so you had freedoms to celebrate Armenian figures from the past, um, to talk about the legacy of the church and um, the power of, of church-tied symbolism. Um, but at the same time, the fact that Parajanov was arrested, um, perhaps for his personal activities, perhaps for his um, films, um, shows that you know, there was still um, a fine line in terms of what could be done. Um, but as I said before, certain figures were promoted. Tumanyan had his house museum constructed and so on. Um, <clears throat> people like Abovian had a statue, Hachatur Abovian, who wrote the first Armenian, Eastern Armenian novel, had a statue constructed, Mikhail Nalbandian, in the 50s and 60s. Um, you also had some national figures like Vardan Mamakonian and David of Sassoon, who were um, allowed to be sculpted in quite important areas of the city, like outside the Yerevan train terminal there, um, or the Vardan Mamakonians just slightly outside the centre. Um, and you really get the feeling that um, the arts are starting to foster a sense of Armenian identity. So um, I had a great discovery just browsing the shelves in um, the School of Oriental and African Studies Library in London, because um, I was looking for materials to teach my students. Um, and I found a whole shelf of guidebooks to Yerevan from different periods in the Soviet, um, <laughs> Soviet Union. And um, there were some from the 50s, some from the 60s, some from 70s, 80s. So you got a really interesting picture of how the view of Yerevan changed and how the image of Yerevan changed and different things they were emphasizing in the guidebooks over time. And so that's a good exercise to do with students to show, you know, the extent to which there was um, sort of support for people like Stalin or to what extent there was, um, they were part of the international image of, of Yerevan at different times. So from uh, this example, uh, this is a, a short quotation from one of the guidebooks. Um, and this is from, I think, 1963, I'm not sure, this guidebook. Um, the, the statue was built in 1950, so that's that date. But I think this guidebook is 1963, I'm not sure, but I can find it for you. 
And it says, um, above the Matana Duran, on the brow of the Kanaka Plateau in Victory Park, stands the Victory Memorial, visible from many points in the city, with its 16.5 meter sculpture of Stalin by Raphael Israelian and Sergei Mukurov, it is 50 meters high. In the pedestal under the statue, there is to be a museum. The details of the pedestal, the gutters, flagstaff, and door, designed by Israelian and carved by stonemasons in traditional Armenian style, is of considerable interest. So I found it interesting how in this guidebook, they're actually drawing the tourists' attention to the Armenian carved doorway of the museum, not, um, as in the previous guidebooks, to the statue of Stalin. So um, in the previous guidebooks that were before the death of Stalin or still in the 1950s, they were doing the typical slow description of every detail of Stalin and how he's standing with his hand under his coat and how uh, the wind is lightly blowing his features and things like that. So detailed description of the statue itself in all the earlier guidebooks. But then as things start to thaw, you start to see more and more expressions of you know, the value of Armenian crafts and Armenian aspects of all these monuments, which is really interesting. Um, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure, probably you all know more than me, the story behind the choice of Mother Armenia to replace Stalin. Um, but um, Levon Abrahamian, who's written a really interesting book called um, Armenian Identity... Um, in Changing Times or something like that. Um, anyway, it's a good book that looks at a number of aspects of um, modern Armenian identity and how it goes back, different aspects go back to pre-modern aspects, folk identities and so on. Um, and he's a anthropologist who works at Yerevan State University and a, a lovely guy um, and a very um, excellent scholar. And he's written, he's unpicked many of these sort of symbols which um, nobody knows where they came from. And for Mother Armenia, he says, it was most probably borrowed from the mod modern Russian tradition. Um, example, the famous poster, Mother Homeland Calls You, of the first days of World War II, and of the huge post-war memorial in Volgograd or Stalingrad. Perhaps this was one of the reasons that Mother Armenia was not enthusiastically received and never succeeded in becoming a new symbol of Armenianness. Although it's interesting that when people like Kim Kardashian go to Yerevan, they have their photograph next to Mother Armenia. <laughs> so some people do appreciate Mother Armenia, although perhaps it's not <clears throat> sort of taken to the heart of um, people from Yerevan. Um, so as I said before, 1965 was a turning point where you start to see much bigger protests. Um, and as this quotation from one of the people who was protesting says... Um, everyone was awed that the genocide was being talked about. They agreed to build the genocide memorial, uh, which was completed in 1967. So, um, as it says here, it was a transfer of the um, private memorialization of the genocide to the landscape of the capital. And so it became this um, <clears throat> public procession that now, on um, the 24th of April, um, a large group of Armenians from Yerevan and from elsewhere, um, walk through the city to the complex and leave their flowers, and, and so it's, it's a big public action. Um, and Abrahamian, the scholar I mentioned before, said it was designed as a gaping grave um, to allow for this public commemoration to, to take place. Um, but um, there's been a difficult sort of transition in terms of how to dismantle um, other figures um, and what to replace them with as, as the thaw has developed. So, um, as I mentioned before, Lenin Square was a very important ceremonial space. Um, it started to be used for more national-type celebrations as the thaw went on. So there was a huge celebration in 1968 to celebrate Yerevan's um, 2,750th anniversary. Um, and this was part of a... Uh, a new Soviet um, appreciation for um, different aspects of the roots of Armenian identity. So they started to draw more attention to the um, antiquity, the age of Yerevan itself, and studies on Erebuni, um, the, the precursor to Yerevan, um, and um, this idea that um, you know Armenian identity goes back to sort of prehistoric um, examples. So this started to be 
um, <clears throat> encouraged more in the 1960s and, and the Thor period um, through public events, but also through academic studies. Um, so you see um, that celebration of, of Yerevan's anniversary, and you also see some other things that I think I skipped over. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, so the 1,600th anniversary of the creation of the Armenian alphabet in 1962, um, and what I already mentioned that, oh no, that was later, 1968. Oh no, that was the same thing, the founding. So they're viewing the founding of Erebuni as the precursor to Yerevan because it was the, um, <clears throat> the prehistoric um, capital on the same, on the same um, site. So these kind of events took place to 